I was born in India in a village in on the 1st of July 1918 1918 I was born on the 11th of November at 11 o'clock 1918 the war came to an end so my birth was like a blessing you know for, for the world then up to the age of nine I hadn't seen my father because before I was born my father had gone to South Africa so at the age of nine he sent a ticket for me so for the first time now I'm going from the village to Bombay the seaport and for the first time in my life I see the sea it took us almost one month from Bombay to Durban in August 1927 I reached Durban South Africa the Madrasa Arcade in Durban, South Africa. The curious narrow alleyways of the Madrasa Arcade are familiar to Yaqub Mahtar. Over 50 years ago, he and his young friend Ahmed would wander through the marketplace on their way to the tailor shop of Ahmed's father, Hussein Didat. And this is the shop of Mr. Didat, Mr. Didat Senior. Right. Now, here, here was a machine, a, 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 a manual pedal machine. Uh, the machine was here and all around him used to be material, patching material. So if any customer came and he wanted some patching done, then he would take a piece of material nearest to what the man had and then he would patch it up and his fee was about 25 cents. Nine-year-old Ahmed Didat moved to Durban in 1927 to join his father Hussein, who had settled there a few years earlier. Ahmed's voyage to South Africa had been long and difficult. In fact, he almost never made it to the streets of Durban. I nearly never disembarked. The ship was one day late, and the authorities wanted to send us all back. But my father insisted on taking me off the ship. When I got off and rode on a tram, I thought my father owned the tram. I saw my father pay the fare. I thought he was paying the wages of one of his employees. The tiny shop in which his father worked made little revenue. Due to the strict apartheid government, his opportunities were limited since he was not of European descent. But Hussein Didat was not driven by sales. No, no, he was not interested in that. He led a sim very simple life. At that moment, he didn't have in that his mind that he wants to be somebody with a lot of money, no. All he did was, uh, he made a living out of it. A humble living. And I think he didn't push for any more money. Whatever he earned for the day, he was quite happy with it. Close the shop and go and talk to the shopkeepers around there and walk around. My father was a strong man. He loved the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam intensively and did not tolerate any disrespect towards the messenger. My father was not a worldly man. He was only interested in working to the extent necessary to make ends meet. Much of the money went to pay for the rent of their small apartment in Ismail building next to one of the oldest mosques in Durban. One of Ahmed's neighbors in the building, Ahmed Suleiman Balim, would eventually become one of his lifelong supporters. Uh, this is the building. And on the right you see this apartment here, Ahmad Didat and his family stayed. Uh -huh. And I used to be his neighbor 
next one, which is in apartment number two. But you are very close. So we're very close. In fact, nice people, but the family was very poor people. We didn't have a time to go into his home and spend hours with him in the city and chatting. We didn't have it, but we used to meet. Ahmed enrolled at the Anjuman school, where he was in standard four. It was the first time he had seen the letters ABC and heard the words yes and no. In six months' time, however, he had learned English and became the top of his class. He was promoted to the next standard, where he also excelled academically. It was not difficult for me to move from India because I was young, so I adapted very easily. Every day he walked to school and back home because his father couldn't afford the bus fare of two pennies. He later moved on to Sastri College, a respectable school built by an Indian immigrant to South Africa. Ahmed showed up for the first day of his new school in his clean new uniform, ready to hit the books. But this is where Ahmed Didat's education came to an abrupt end. He must have spent only a few hours walking these corridors because after only three days at college, his father pulled him out. Financial considerations put an abrupt end to him furthering his education. I was not sad when I had to leave college. I had to work when I left college. So it was a matter of survival. My father told me to go to work, and I went to work at Adam's Mission. Adam's Mission was outside Durban in the rolling hills of rural South Africa. Ahmed took a job in a country store called the O.N. Muhammad shop. Just across the way was the enormous Adam's Mission complex, an institute where young missionaries learned how to convert others to Christianity. The new Muslim shopkeeper across the road, who knew next to nothing about any religion, became their homework. Almost from the day he arrived, he found the students and the teachers um, attacking Islam and attacking Muslims. It was a daily event for him to hear disparaging remarks, especially remarks like the Quran, your Quran is false, your prophet is false, your religion is false, you are destined for hell. He was very easy target at that time because firstly he didn't even know much about Islam. All he knew was La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. As soon as they should see this easy meat, they should go for it. And they should hammer the brains out of the head. So they would come to the shop to do their buying, sugar, salt, flour, rice, and then they would start with us. He says, you know, Muhammad had so many wives. I knew nothing about that. He says, you know, Muhammad, the spirit is a religion at the point of the sword. Meaning, he threatened people that if you do not accept my religion, I'm going to chop off your heads. I knew nothing about that. So he copied his book, the Quran, from the Jews and the Christians. I knew nothing about that. Now, this constant attack, what was I to do? We went to Adam's mission to ask the missionaries if there was anyone around who still remembered Ahmed Didat and the shop. Desmond, the teacher and public relations director at the missionary college there, does remember going to the store often. There's not much left of the store today, but Desmond took us to the site where it used to stand. Yeah, that's where the shop used to be, and uh, it was all burned out. But I see. Yes. And is this the foundation stone here of where the... the yeah, that's the, that's, the, that's the foundation here. Yeah. Yes, because, you know, it was wood and iron, so that's why yeah, it got bent out completely. Where was the front of the shop? The front of the shop was here, okay. facing this way, facing the college. Okay. And w <laughs> what is that house over there? What <laughs> That building here, it, it, it was a, a building that was uh, uh, owned by Mr. Mohammed himself, or N. Mohammed, he used to stay in here. So that's where could, Mr. Sad could have stayed too. Might may have stayed there too, yeah. yeah. As a young person, he was agitated and angered by this type of harassment. And he felt uh, an urge and, an, and a desire to respond to them, but he was not equipped to deal with the challenges because he didn't have the background knowledge in, in, in developing the responses that were required. 
It was while he was cleaning out the shop where he worked that he stumbled across a book that would change his life. A book which remains in his personal library to this day. This one here, this is the Izharul book, Izharul Haq. The this is revealed, it. The original. This is the book he found. This that is the book. Ironically, Izhar al Haq was a religious dialogue between a Christian priest and a Muslim imam. In it, Didat found for the first time a response to the Christian allegations posed to him. Book by book, page by page, his mind began filling with dates, names, facts, and quotes. But not only was he learning about his own religion, he found one book in particular very interesting, the Bible. This is Mr. Didad's very first notebook, the very first ever notebook of his research. The Bible verses there, cut out, he cut out Bible verses and he stuck them alongside. These are his hard work research in the 40s. He knew the Bible more than even the Quran. He studied the Bible and he could quote at random at any time, any place. The type of um, format that my father had when he read books, History of the Jews by Paul Goodman, when he reads books, as soon as he has read them, he makes notes, specific notes. Jews hailed Muslims. Conquest, page 71. So it's easy reference. And he marks them. Look at that. Islam. He marks every book. So all this is the University of Sheikh Ahmad Dida. No schooling. This is where he went to school. This is his school. You're looking at the University of Sheikh Ahmad Didat. And I call this the University of Hard Knocks. Where you have to knock your head and read and read and read and no end of reading. Ahmad Didat now had his armor. His shield would be his extensive knowledge of the Bible and Quran. And his sword would be his frank piercing style of delivery. In 1940, he took to the stage and began giving lectures to small audiences, the first of which was Muhammad, the Messenger of Peace. His friends helped him secretly put up posters at night, since it was illegal to hang posters advertising such a talk. The greatest and the first moment of my life and the pride started about Ahmad Didat, when I was a boy of 12, when he gave his first lecture in a cinema known as Avalon in the year 1939 or 40. His wife, Hawa, was at first shocked to see her husband doing so well up on the stage. I thought, can this man talk? <laughs> then, of course, the audience was small, sometimes 10 people, 12 people, because he was the, then he was just coming up, you know? But his talks gained in popularity until eventually he found himself here, at the town hall in Durban. He now had a full house of around 2,000 people. Didat's lectures here were some of the few events in which segregation briefly disappeared. His message was that there were many contradictions in the Christian Bible and doctrine, and that Muhammad was indeed a noble messenger sent by God. Half a century later, the seats are empty and the great hall is nearly silent. All that remains is the sound of the antique grand piano getting a tune-up. This piano, too, was a quiet spectator at many of Ahmed Didat's lectures here. But it must have long forgotten the scores of those angry listeners who stood up to challenge him, as well as the numerous conversions which occurred after his talks. How many times is Mary, the mother of Jesus, mentioned in your Bible? I said, the Christian. I want a Christian to answer that, please. Sir, I want to ask you a question. No, no. Why you mention a monitor in this, uh, in this mission? My dear brother, simple question, simple. No, I was not trying to score any points. I said, how many times? Is Mary, the mother of God, your mother of God, how many times is she mentioned in your book? But the footsteps of that first night can still be heard by those who listen hard enough. Once a shy young businessman fresh from Gujarat, 
Suleiman Sheikhji can still remember the exact spot where he sat over half his lifetime ago. So, so either, either you are lying, lying bloody, bloody deceiving, deceiving people. people. For him, Didat is still on the stage, his distinctive arms flying about, his booming voice echoing throughout the auditorium. He can still feel the excitement of the crowd and the tension in the air. It's been a long time, hasn't it? Very really long time. Over 40 years. And you'd be seated here? Yes. What would Ahmed Didat talk about? About Prophet Muhammad. And just in time of Jesus. Muhammad in Islam. What the Bible say about Christian. What was he like as a speaker? Was he? He speak very well. Simple English. He speak. All understand. Even small children used to come there to like him to understand him. What was their response? What did they think of Ahmed Didat? Did they like him? Did they hate him? No, we all liked him. A few of them just hate him. Of some Christian missionaries, they used to hate him. We attended. Uh, not so much for the uh, benefit we would have got out of his talks. Not so much for that, or not so much to learn. We were young people in our early twenties, and he was, uh, I won't say hating back at the Christians, but he was debating and putting our point across to them and he was like like when you go to a boxing match and you got your hero hitting the opposite side that was more en than anything else not so much to learn my early talks were very successful very successful and I expected them to be a hit because I was rising raising a hot topic so I anticipated a strong turnout Oh, Papa, I am a He used to lecture in the house a lot, and I used to complain, you're making a lot of noise. You're a very noisy man. <laughs> I was very, very proud of him. Every lecture, every way, wherever Mr. Didat was gone, I was always present there. But we were supporting him in his uh, work, and we always tell him that you go ahead. Whatever you want to do, and we'll push you, and we'll help you in whatever manner we can. We'll support you all the way. But not everyone was so supportive. Some Christians and Hindus felt his sarcastic comments were disrespectful. They were also frustrated because the evidence he gave was from their own holy books. Many Muslims in Durban felt he was too aggressive in his talks. Organized missionary work was not common in the Muslim world. It was the many Muslims, Indian Muslims of Durban, who objected to Ahmad Didat that he should not discuss any religion or anything and bring the friction between the Christian and the Muslim. They even asked Ahmad Didat that, Ahmad, stop this, let's not be, bring enemies, please don't go on the platform. And we, as we had Mr. A.I. Kaji and uh, many other Muslims told him, we will go and tell them that you are young and your blood is hot and you just got onto the stage to say something, but you found it, you cannot do it, so please step down. But Ahmed did that. He says, no, I will do what I want to do. I don't think at that particular time the Molalas hated him or disliked him. Because he didn't cross swords with them. The Maulanas were not opposed to me, but they were indifferent to my preaching. They may have been afraid to support someone who was challenging the religion of those who ruled the country at the time. I did not feel threatened by the government, although the special branch visited me and they told me, you are the most dangerous man in South Africa and there is nothing we can do about it. Eventually some Muslims became impressed with him and changed their views after they saw Christians and Hindus converting to Islam. 
He spoke. I would not remember much, but I believe that two Christian priests and three or four Europeans embraced Islam at his lecture. And those who objected to him, like A.I. Kaji and Kaji Musa, and many of them came and shook hands with Ahmad Didat and said, Ahmad, we didn't expect this greatness out of you. But many were to remain opposed to his potent missionary tactics, and some of his strongest opponents were of his own flesh and blood, including his own brother, Abdullah. But Ahmed was devoted to spreading Islam in the best way he knew how, by speaking. He looked forward to the question and answer sessions at the end of his lectures, in which Christians would line up with their Bibles in hand, ready to refute his points. But no question was too difficult for him. He could silence his challenges by quoting the Bible from memory. Meanwhile, Ahmed Didat was working to support his family as well as his preaching. I met Ahmed Didat in 1945, uh, when, I was, um, when I was given employment by uh, a firm called Simplex Furniture Factory. The building of the Simplex Furniture Factory where Ahmed Didat worked is now a Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant. Now, this building uh, was originally a big warehouse in which there was a furniture showroom. Ahmed Didat's desk was here. Okay. Yeah, he used to sit down there, organize his dispatch. And right. this is where Ahmed Didat worked? Where Ahmed Didat, as a young man, worked here as a dispatch clerk for the Simplex Furniture Factory, which was the name of the business at the time. So there wasn't a wall here at that time? There was no wall. There was only a door here. Now, whatever goods were sold and to be delivered is to come out of this door. And at lunchtime, he would lock up the door, open again at 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock, close and take the key home. So he was solely responsible for this door. Now, he was given this uh, responsibility because he was an honest man and his boss, our boss, because I was also working for him, realized that with him holding the door key, there will be no pilfering. Ahmed even found opportunities at the furniture factory to give his spiel on comparative religion. We had an African worker with him, a very nice, humble fellow, and Didad somehow liked him. He should take him to his house to do the odd jobs, you know, like how you to make use of these people. They work for a firm, how you take them and do your private work a bit here and there. But his name was Dadan Pengu, that was his name. And he was a very nice fellow, humble fellow, so Didad took a liking to him. And he became Didat's first guinea pig. So he started working on him, the Dan Bengo, and he converted him. Ahmed's preaching began to take over his life. He moved to apartment number 45, Hussein Building, where he put in countless hours of planning as well as budgeting. My father spent his own money and he printed cards talking about Islam to the Zulu people, to the black people, and you would see clearly here his home address, 45 Hussein's building, Queen Street, Durban, and his home phone number. And he began to do this on his own, distribute cars, everything, his own money. Many times they didn't have enough money to pay rent for their flat, the homes that they were living in. It was a great struggle, a struggle throughout as you know, his wife used to make sweetmeats and sell during the Eid al-Adha. He used to have sheep and goat that he used to sell to augment his salary. He was a super salesman. He could have been earning a lot of money, but he gave that up. We're right outside of the house where Ahmed Didat used to live. The reason I'm trying to be quiet is because the current occupants have asked us to keep the noise down. You see, there's someone inside who isn't feeling very well, has just had a stroke. We might try and make our way in in a minute and take a look inside if possible. But it's interesting to note that this house is very close to the mosque right across the road in Durban. That's the mosque where Ahmed Didat used to take visitors for a little tour. 
and it was strategically positioned because he used to invite people to come to his home, have a meal, have some samosas, and explain to them what Islam is, and then tell them, you know, there's a mosque just across the road. Would you like to come take a, a look at the mosque? And that was part of the core strategy, the core Dawa strategy of Ahmed Didat in the early days. The front door is as far as we got, but it was obvious that this was not luxury housing. He must have lived humbly to save money for his preaching. And although money was tight, he still tried to make his family a priority. Whenever I'd see something I liked, Mr. Didat would buy it for me. I didn't even have to ask. All I would say is, that's nice, and he would get it. Meanwhile, his popularity was growing nationwide. He was invited to Cape Town, where he received an overwhelming response. As a boy growing up in Cape Town, Ibrahim Saleh Muhammad not only attended Ahmed's lectures, he also helped to promote them. I know this road so well. You know, in the past we used to, when Sheikh Tidat used to come to Cape Town, we used to come down this road and post posters all over the show. Um, sometimes illegally, but in those years there weren't any uh, clauses in the government to say that we couldn't do it. And that was one of the areas that gained in popularity was the fact that his poster was all over the show and everybody wanted to meet this man and see who he is. And, uh, Ibrahim's father Saleh, who was then the owner of the Rosmead supermarket, befriended Ahmed late one night when he came to the shop needing a favor. Sheikh Ahmed Irat had a talk at uh, one of the mosques and the lecture ended quite late and he normally stayed with the Sayyids and when he returned to the Sayyid's residence that night, the place had been locked up and he couldn't get the Sayyid's awake. And the person that took him to the Sayyid's house said, well, they know of somebody that would still be awake that time of the morning, uh, referring to my dad. And when they went, they came around to the small store that we had, my dad was busy packing fruit and veg. And, well, offered him a place to sleep for the night and he's been, well, he's, he slept with us whenever he came through to Cape Town. The two men would go on to become close friends. Saleh would reserve the halls for Ahmed to speak in when he came to town. In Cape Town, he lectured in huge lecture halls, including the Good Hope Center and City Hall. But his lectures there had more than just religious significance. Many of the Muslims of the Cape had been brought over from Indonesia, Malaysia and India as slaves and political prisoners. They felt downtrodden and were tired of life as second-class citizens. To them, Ahmed Didat was a knight in shining armor who had come to liberate them from the pressures of hardline missionaries and the idea that Islam was not a credible religion. I think because of the condition that the people found themselves in, um, they were subjected, most of the people lived below the breadline and the Christians offered something to them. They offered them food and money and they would um, they would change the religion for this and Sheikh Ahmadi that offered them something that they could counter um, with this. The Western arrogance made you feel uh, a lesser human being together with the apartheid ideas you were not equal to the white man and your faith was therefore suspect or part of an uncivilized and so Sheikh Ahmad going there and, 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 and having these debates and presenting Islam as a positive force and dealing a hefty blow to the Christian missionary aggression right raised the morale of the Muslims and in his gatherings in the Cape 30 40 thousand people used to turn up but along with his momentum came the demand for a professional organization which could manage the size of planning and the money he needed to continue. And so in 1957, Ahmed Didat, alongside two of his closest friends, founded the Islamic Propagation Center in Durban. The organization's first base was a tiny one-room office in the Madrasa Arcade. The three founders started recruiting staff, one of whom was a secretary by the name of Muhammad Khan. So he said, join me. Join us, Mr. Renka and Mr. Didate, they wanted to type this. I'm a type typist. Right. So, he said, right, come and join me. 
I did commerce books and all, so come and join us. We need people like you. So I, I said, I can't, I must wind up the thing. Give me a month's chance to close up the business and hand it over. So I handed it over and I came and joined them in 1959. In its early years, the IPC was involved in printing books and organizing classes for new Muslim converts. They would go door to door collecting money for their activities. Ahmed developed a good rapport with his staff, although he had a reputation for being demanding. A stone man, he wants a job done, must be done. That's how his work was. You can't fool around with him. You want to do a thing, you must do it. Don't ask questions. Then one night in 1958, after a lecture in a mosque, Ahmed was given an offer he simply couldn't refuse. A man by the name of Haji Kadwa approached him and offered to donate 75 acres of land on the south coast for the sake of Islamic propagation. It sounded too good to be true. His lifelong dream of establishing an Islamic version of Adam's mission had just fallen out of the sky. And so a salam was born as a Muslim seminary where students would learn about comparative religion and how to pass on the teachings of Islam. Ahmed and his family uprooted from Durban and moved 80 kilometers south to the uninhabited hills surrounding As Salam. He had to chop down trees just to reach the land. Once he arrived, he immediately put his hand to the plow in establishing the institution. He was the builder, the carpenter, the plumber, the one that brought the water from the dam established a dam and brought the water from the river. He made the roads. So almost all his time, because the resources were so limited, almost all his time went into building the structure. And as you know, he remained there for 17 years. But in that 17 years, we were starved of funds. So the little money that came in was used to build the structure. Students enrolled and classes began. As-Salam was at last up and running. Both he and his wife continued to work in the fields as well as in the classroom. And so with his house built on site and with the mosque and school already built, the stage seemed set for Ahmed Dad to achieve his dream of a Muslim Da'i college. And yet that dream was to turn out very differently from how Sheikh Didat envisaged. The development of As-Salam is indeed a milestone. It was the idea of one person who was perhaps too far ahead of his time. He was in many ways a pioneer in his ideas, but the community around him were not quite ready to establish such a vast institute. After 17 long years and despite Ahmed's best efforts, a salam was failing. The lack of funding and expertise was proving to be too much. In 1973, he finally asked the trustees to relieve him of as salam And so without ever realizing his dream, Didat returned to Durban and as salam was made into a private Islamic school. I was relieved when I left as salam because I wanted to focus more on the IPC. As-Salam did not let me focus enough on Dawa internationally. He set his hopes for just that, an international audience. His first opportunity to go abroad came sooner rather than later. On a trip to the World Association of Muslim Youth Conference in Riyadh in 1976, Ibrahim Jadwat took Ahmed along for some exposure. When I asked the, the Saudi television people to uh, interview him, um, you know, they laughed at me saying that they have 50 or 60 great scholars from all over the world, but why should we interview him? And so I said, look, give him two minutes of your time, and I'm sure that you will find something interesting. So they gave him, they humored me, and they gave him the opportunity to come on TV. And of course, the next day they were there because he was an instant hit with his approach, his dynamism, his personality, and the, and the ideas that he presented was an instant hit. So they came back every day for more and more, and, and that's how he was... Open, opened up to the Muslim world. The Arab world was swept off its feet. They were thrilled by his knowledge of Christianity and his entertaining speeches. 
then uh, you didn't uh, you don't have any degree, scientific degree, or you didn't graduate from university? No, I didn't have that good fortune. I passed a very primary uh, stage in education, what we in my country call standard six. That is four years before metric. Yeah. I finished off. And how could you be like that? So much knowledgeable. You see, I suppose it's experience. You know, it has been a hobby with me, but this was actually forced by the Christians onto me. The money he got, because money talks, you know, made him uh, high and mighty, really. The first trip to, to Riyadh was a major event in his life. There is a letter that he wrote to the then uh, Secretary General Ghulam Hussein Vanka in which he says that coming to this conference has, will make, I can feel that one of my dreams of printing and distributing the Quran and the literature in the volumes that we require will be realized by the people that I'm meeting and the opportunities that I am now uh, presented with. Going to Riyadh was a turning point for me. Not because it opened up the East, but Riyadh o opened up the West for me. July of 1985, he agreed to a debate in the Royal Albert Hall in London with an American missionary, Professor Floyd Clark. The topic was the crucifixion of Jesus. He had fine-tuned the art of debating with them on issues that were critical. And all he was saying is that you have declared a war on, on me and my faith, and I'm obliged to respond. And the only way that I can respond is by questioning the things that you are questioning me about. For example, if you said that my Quran is false, is the Bible the word of God? More than 50% of the bishops, paid servants of the Anglican Church, they are telling their congregation, Jesus, you don't have to believe. If you don't have to believe, join hands with us. That's what we're trying to tell you for 1400 years. We were telling you, Lakat Kaparallah. So the first opportunity came up at Albert Hall, and it was opportune because it was also in the summer, and a lot of Muslims from different parts of the world were coming for their holidays um, to London at that time. And so it was an instant hit. Uh, this is the teaching of scripture that Jesus was resurrected and Jesus was alive. <laughs> With regards to the, the word risen or resurrected in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, not once is the word resurrection used in connection with Jesus that he's resurrected, not once. So once that Albert Hall event took place, then it was like the floodgates opening up, Salahuddin with his, you know, uh, raising his flag of Islam in the capitals of the Western world, giving the arrogant white man a big slap in the face. After London, he was swept up in a whirlwind of tours. Morocco, Sweden, Kenya, Australia and Denmark. The world was too small a stage for him. And with nearly every debate, he had made more fans and more foes. Mr. Ahmed Didat challenged me and he did it clearly, openly, without hesitating that he had come as a guest to Sweden. He even insulted me with a smile in his face. You see, I have been, the, the, the pastor will say, challenging. What I say, I'm appealing to my Christian brothers, learned people. In my meetings all over the world, when I have a chance, I said, brothers, sisters, I would like you to do me a favor. If Jesus is God, I would like you to show me one verse, only one statement anywhere in your Bible any version of the Bible where Jesus says, I am God, or where he says, worship me. He was so anxious to meet their best, because the best was too small for him. <laughs> Which means, and he mistranslated, 
If you remember, get the tape and you see, he mistranslated for which he has not apologized yet. And then at last, the person who was finally on his level agreed to a match. My most memorable talk was the debate with the giant, Jimmy Swaggart of the USA. What man can must have is a change of heart. The American Reverend Jimmy Swaggart was the head of a $100 million ministry and his sermons were televised in over 30 countries. The topic of the Swaggart DDAT debate was, is the Bible the word of God? 8,000 people showed up, ready to watch what would become known as the Great Debate. The debate that took place really was, in many ways, the culmination of Ahmad Didat's lifelong mission to challenge those that had declared war on Islam, those that were denigrating Islam. And so he was vindicated. What was amazing was...